I am forgiven because you are forsaken. I am accepted. You are condemned. I am alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Those are some powerful, powerful words. Good afternoon, everyone. Please open your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of First Peter. We are finally breaking through out of First Peter chapter 1, and we are moving into First Peter chapter 2. Uh, my apologies, I do not have it on the screen for you this week. Uh, the reason being is because uh, I have a full-time job, and uh, sometimes I have time to put things together, sometimes I don't. <laughs> And uh, this week, don't have that time. So uh, please go ahead and read it in your Bibles. It's also in your bulletin. But what I'm going to do today is, uh, in our reading, I'm going to start in, at the end of First Peter. I'm going to begin at, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to begin at verse 22 of First Peter. And uh, we're going to read through to chapter 2, verse 3. Now, I preached last week on 22 through 25, the end of chapter 1, and uh, today our message is on verses 1, 2, and 3 of chapter 2. So what I'll do is I will read verses 22 through 25, and then please pick up with me verses 1 through 3 in chapter 2. Okay, here we go. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Please read with me. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. The words of God, amen. Well, uh, the reason I started out in verse 22 of the previous chapter is um, this is the part two of of a thought. Uh, Peter is uh, in in the section here. And uh, the reason why, uh, well, we have this strange chapter division. The, the The person who put in the chapters of the Bible uh, I lived around the 15th century, is a researcher in France. And so the French, they have, a, I guess, a different way of doing things. I don't know. But uh, he's the one that put in the chapters and the verses. Actually, no, the verses. And so, um, but the thought in the, in the Greek, which is the original language it was written in, has no verses, no chapters, and it's just one complete letter. But anyway, uh, the thought that we are looking at, that we're studying last week and this week, is one thought, and it starts in verse 22, and it ends in verse 3 of chapter 1. And uh, last week, just want to just do a quick review, talked on the obedience, the three main uh, things that he talked about in verses 22 to 25 are obedience, a love for one another, and uh, the Word of God, and obedience being something that purifies the soul. Oh, Amen. It's, you, know, it's, you have purified yourself through obedience to the truth. The truth is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and faith in the gospel, faith in Jesus Christ, is obedience to that truth. And there's something, uh, there's a purifying quality in our lives uh, that happens when we learn the obedience of God, when we look at Jesus Christ and how he obeyed, and when we seek to obey God regardless of the consequence, regardless of the circumstance, and we choose, I am going to obey God in this situation, this situation, in every situation. Our lives are purified magnificently by our obedience. Um, So uh, then there's that love 
for one another. Uh, that obedience isn't just for uh, purification's sake, but it's for uh, this purification of a love that we have for one another. And then Peter says something really weird. He says, you have a love that's real. You have a sincere love. Okay? And then he says, you have it, now go use it. Right? He says it twice. He says, now that you have a sincere love, love one another deeply with all your heart. So I, I, I just thought, what does that mean? And I gave the illustration, a terrible illustration, of an old MP3 player and a new iPod. And uh, basically I'm, what I'm saying is uh, I had this old raggedy piece of junk MP3 player and when I updated to, or excuse me, upgraded to an iPod, I have the real thing. This MP3 player was 2,000 yen. It cost me. It was, it was just, it, you get what you pay for, 2,000 yen. And this new iPod cost me 20,000 yen. It's literally 100 times better than this little MP3. And uh, that's what we have when we have the love of God. We have the sincere love that, that God gives us. It is a hundred times better than the love that we uh, try to give each other without the power of God. It's this you help me, I help you, two-way street kind of love that's contractual, mutually uh, dependent. <clears throat> but God's love is sincere in that it is one way. God loves us regardless of who we are. God loves us despite of who we are. And so what God benefits by giving us love is absolutely nothing. And in Romans it says that God showed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, God, Christ Jesus died for us giving us eternal life. God get nothing, God nothing in return. It's not like he needed our worship. He needed our devotion. He, needed, he didn't need anything. He's God. It's like, it's like saying <clears throat> uh, the sun needs light. Right? What does the sun benefit if we you know, turn on a flashlight and point it at the sun? The sun gets nothing out of that. And the same thing is God's love is just poured out all over uh, unto us. And it's a one-way love, and it's a pure, pure love. But here's what we do. And here's, here's what, uh, what I didn't mention last week, and I'll, I'll say a little bit this week. I have this new iPod. It's way better. It's 100 times better than this little MP3 player I used to have. But what if I did this? What if I took my iPod, and I put it in my, I put it in my closet, and I said, eh, I'll just use my old MP3 player. You know, it's nice. this iPod's nice. It's got all these little gadgets and googies and everything. But I like this, this old MP3 player. How silly would that be? But that's what we do with God's love. We like the way that we do things. We like the way that we love one another. We, like, we prefer the old way of doing things, and we put down God's steadfast, beautiful, sincere love, and we try to do it the old way. And so... So Peter says, now that you have a sincere love for one another, love one another. Use it because you can. And, and put it away. Put away that old piece of junk that you have. And we'll get into that in a minute. Finally, uh, we talked on the Word of God. Uh, it was preached. There's four things he said. It's imperishable. It's living. It's enduring. And it's preached. Uh, the Word of God is what this church stands on. Uh, you can look at the Word of God in one of two ways. You can look at it like this. You could stand above it. It's below you. It's the Word of God, but I have final say on what it, impact it has on my life. I'm above the Word of God. I like some parts. I don't like some, and I'm going to leave that out. I think this is good for me. I think this I don't have to deal with, and I'm going I'm to just set it aside. That's one way we could uh, look at the Word of God. Or we can look at the Word of God like this, and it's above us. And we are under the Word of God. It, is, it has complete authority over us. And I align myself to whatever it has to say. In this situation, I stand under the Word of God. In this situation, I stand under the Word of God. It's the final authority. Because it's living, enduring, and it is the preached Word of God. So, <clears throat> didn't get that to you last week. That was for free this week. Alright, we're moving on into uh, chapter 2, where Peter is 
uh, con uh, continuing his thought, the first word in chapter 2 is, therefore. That's why we know that it's, it's not just a new thing, a new chapter, a new idea. It's part of an older idea. And the therefore is there uh, for a couple of things. Uh, the, the main idea is what Peter says many times, I think three or four times in chapter 1, is that we are what Paul says, new creations. We are new people. We are evolved, as so to speak. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, mentions in his book, I think it's uh, Mere Christianity, a lot of people believe in, in the, you know, Darwin's theory of evolution, where people will eventually evolve physically somehow. But he says, no, 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 you guys got it all wrong. Humans are the epitome of creation, but, and they will evolve, but their evolution is not physical. It's not some physical dynamic that allows us to, that will change. It is the spiritual part of our lives that evolves. And the Bible calls that new birth. New birth. We are born into a living hope. And so Peter says that all throughout chapter 1, you are a new creation, you have been born into a living hope, and you are, you're new. Therefore, therefore, so the first thing you should do is start cleaning house. Start cleaning house. Came home a little bit early from work yesterday and had some cleaning up to do. And uh, I had to take a shower, but I thought, well, before I'm going to shower, let's get some cleaning done. And so we opened up the air conditioning and took out the filters and started just you know, scrubbing away. And now we have a clean air conditioner, okay? You got a clean house. Houses get dirty. Houses get a little bit filthy. And you can be in Christ, you can believe in Jesus Christ. He, can, has, he has washed you all of your sins, away all your sins. But Jesus says, you know what? I still need to clean you. You still need a little bit of a washing. Let me, in fact, let me wash your feet, he says uh, to Peter. And here, Peter, who's had his feet washed by Jesus, is going to teach us how to do a little bit of cleaning. And so what he says is, therefore, uh, get rid of some things. And, and hunger for other things. Therefore, you are a new person. You are a new person, so you have new appetites. You are a new person, so you have new desires. For those of you who have come to Christ, you didn't grow up as a Christian. Okay? For those of you who, who may have grown up in a non-Christian home, you know this, don't you? You come to Jesus after a, how, however long you've lived, you understand the truth of the word. He speaks to you. He grabs you. He says, child, you are mine. And you say, yes, I am yours. And you give your life wholly to Jesus Christ. And what happens? Some things begin to taste differently. Some sins don't taste so good anymore. Some things you used to like, you just don't like anymore. And there's other things that you thought you didn't like before, but now it's really good. And now I hunger and I thirst for it. It's called righteousness. He says, therefore, you are, since you are a newborn person, there's some things that are going to be gone, that need, to get a, that need to be thrown out, and there's some things you need to develop a hunger for. Those things that you're going to throw out is evil. Get rid of evil. And I'm going to break that down in just a little bit. But those things that you're going to want is that pure spiritual milk. There's a, basically, and I'll get down into that, but first of all, just... The big idea is things that you want to avoid, not avoid, but excuse me, get rid of, and then there's things that you're hungering and desiring for. That's the big idea of, of, of the first three chapters of verse 2. Chapter 2, verse, three verses of chapter 2. <clears throat> so you're going to get rid of uh, malice, uh, guile, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of all kind, and you're going to desire the pure spiritual milk of God. Okay. So therefore, and the next phrase is, rid yourselves, rid yourselves of a list of four things, I think five or four, I'm not sure, I can't remember, five or four evils. Rid yourselves of these things. That word, rid yourself in the Greek, it carries the image of a person taking off some old, raggedy, dirty, nasty, filthy clothing and throwing it away. Rid yourself. Rid yourself. 
uh, did some research, and in fact, uh, in the early church, Christians long time ago, when they were baptized, they got baptized naked. I don't know if it's completely naked or if they had an undergarment, but it was naked. Why? Because what they would do is, before they would go into the water, they would take off their old clothes. And when they came out of the water, they were given a new set of clothing. This is a, a, a common practice in the early church. When Christians were baptized, they threw away their old clothes and they were given or they received a new set of clothing. And Peter is referencing this practice probably of getting new clothes at baptism. And he says, what you're going to do now is you're going to get rid of certain things just like those old clothes that you had before your life with Jesus Christ. Get rid of it. Throw it off. It's disgusting. It's old. It's a piece of junk. It's no good for you. You, never, you don't need it. It's useless. Throw it away. And what are those things? First thing is malice, he says. Malice. Malice. Rhymes with Alice. <clears throat> I got my notes here. Malice is um, what someone says is, is anger that's resting in the bosom of a fool. That's what Proverbs says. The fool lets anger just sit and brood right inside his, his, his chest. It's, that, it's not just the anger that's like, Argh! and just releases it real quick. Malice is the anger that likes to just, just marinate down in there. It's that thought that says, mm. it, it, it stays with you uh, throughout the evening, and it's there when you wake up and you like it. It's that anger because it, you feed on this anger. Uh, it's a desire to get revenge. It's a desire to hurt somebody out of a long time of thinking about how they hurt you. And it's this, it's this delight. When something bad happens to someone you don't like, you kind of feel good about it. Oh, they got it. Yes. You don't say it out loud, but you feel it. You say it inside. You think it. That's what malice is. What's the gospel's answer to malice? What is the gospel's answer to hatred out of a long period of time? What does Jesus do? Jesus suffered. Jesus went to the cross. He suffered so that I don't have to suffer, right? That's, uh, that's the substitution through salvation, salvation through substitution. His suffering means I don't suffer. He took my suffering that I deserve. Now take it one step further with me because this is the, the step that a lot of us, including me, don't like to go. Jesus suffered so they don't have to suffer. They hurt me. They got something coming to them. No, 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 no. The gospel says Jesus suffered. Not only for me, but for them. So set them free. And when you set them free, you set yourself free. That's what Jesus did. The second thing we're getting rid of is deceit. Deceit. <clears throat> it's guile. Uh, and it's some translation. It's all kinds of deceit. He says, uh, get rid of all, all malice, right? All malice, all of it. And he says, get rid of all deceit. So there's many kinds of deceit. There's deceit in the words. Um, there's, uh, there's this craftiness where uh, we know that somebody's ignorant or maybe naive and we want to take advantage of them. Taking advantage of someone who's not as smart, not a na not, uh, maybe a little bit naive. Um, that's manipulation. That's for those of us who are in authority, maybe over children, or maybe over uh, employees, or maybe over uh, subordinates at the office. We like to manipulate. We like to pay, play power games. We like to play politics in the office. That's deceit. And uh, it's a desire to gain advantage, the advantage over others at their cost. And God says, get rid of it get rid of every form of it. It's disgusting to me. I don't like it. And so what does he do? What's the gospel's answer to deceit? What does Jesus say? The meek shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Not the emperor, not the king, not the general, 
not the boss, not the manager, not the overbearing, not the strong, not the powerful. Jesus came as a baby, as an infant in a small town, and lived as a poor carpenter and at three, for three years of his life, homeless. And he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Why? Why? Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. This is the gospel. God takes the humble, the lowly of heart, and he lifts them up. And he takes you who like to manipulate and play power politics in your office. He likes to bring you down. Because God opposes the proud and, uh, and uplifts the humble. Get rid of deceit. The next is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, uh, it's a plural again. It's not just one kind of hypocrisy. It's everything. It's the church fakes. It's the religious fakes. It's the fake friends. We'll be friends, but not really. I don't really care about you, but we'll be friends because it benefits me. It's the fake promises. Yeah, I'll do it when really you have no intention at all of doing that. It's every kind of falsity. It's fake fakeness. Uh, what does Jesus say? What's the gospel to hypocrisy? Say to hypocrisy, Jesus says, "Let your yes be yes, and your no be no." Uh, this one really hits me because this is my biggest weak weak point. It's hypocrisy. And uh, uh, let's see, we got five here, five listed, and uh, I look at. Uh, three of the five, and I think that's no problem for me. Let me just be completely honest with you, okay? This, this really nailed me this week when I was thinking about this. Because I, I look at this list and I say, oh yeah, evil, don't need it, don't like it, don't want it. I live for God, I'm holy, I'm a child of God, I'm righteous, I'm a child of the light. It fills me. I read the Bible every day, I pray for people every day. I don't do these things. And God says, take a good, real look at yourself. And let's be honest. If you take a look at this list, yeah, yes, maybe there's two or three things. It's no problem for you to throw away. I don't, I don't involve myself in that. But then it, maybe there's one or two, and let, maybe if we're honest, three or four, that we have real problems with. That just is like an arrow that hits us right between the eyes and says, God says, you need to deal with this. You need to throw this off. For me, one of those things is definitely hypocrisy. I like to tell people to do things that I don't uh, myself have any intention of living up to. I like to say things and recommend things to people and give them advice when I don't even think about following it myself. Let me give you one example, okay? Let me be completely honest. Uh, I, uh, I'm a co I, I coach high school basketball. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to think I'm, I'm a good coach, but oftentimes I'm, I'm just a power player, power-hungry, manipulative uh, little boy. And I tell my players, you got to run, 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 run. Do your push-ups, do your sit-ups, wake up early every day, and let's get stronger, and let's be more physical, and, and run, 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 run. And I hate running. I hate it. I ran a, when I was a player, I ran a lot, too. But I don't think I was, my coach was as mean as I was. And uh, that's just a small example, but I do that a lot in a lot of my life, to my students, uh, to my players, and even to my friends, and to uh, hopefully not you, but uh, if, I'm, if I'm honest, maybe I do. And that is, that's hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy. It's disgusting to God. Jesus will have none of it. Let your yes be yes, your no be no, and live up to what you expect others of others. Uh, another thing, another example, uh, when God changed my life, when I was, uh, well, changed my life a lot, but the first time when I gave my life wholly to Christ, I was 15, I realized when I went to church, I was church Chris. When I went to school, I was school Chris. And when I was at home, I was at home Chris. And I had, there was three different lives I was leading. Hypocrisy is living those three different lives. And God said, you need to become one person, whether it's at church, at home, or at work. Be one person. Get rid of hypocrisy. Let's move on. Uh, get rid of all envy. Uh, in your scriptures it says, en uh, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of all kinds. Of all kinds refers to hypocrisy, envy, and slander. So 
So all kinds of hypocrisy, all kinds of envy, all kinds of slander, we need to get rid of. And all kinds of envy, that is uh, grieving at the welfare of others. Basically, good things happen to people, others that you don't like, you don't feel good. It's kind of the opposite of uh, uh, malice there. Uh, you can't rejoice with those who rejoice because you want what they have. It's the win-lose mentality. If somebody's going to win, somebody has to lose. It better not be me. It's the hyper-competitiveness. One of my best friends, Jim, uh, love him to death. He's uh, just a real soul brother to me, but I cannot compete with him in, every, in anything because he always has to win, and it's evil. I can't, because I like to win too. I don't like losing, but he hates losing all the more, so he'll, he'll do all he can to win. So I'm going to point the finger at him, okay? Uh, but uh, I, was playing, I was playing a toy with my son, a little fishing game, and uh, it's this thing you've got to pull the fish out. You know, there's eight fish you've got to pull out. And so there's two fishing poles, eight fish, you've got to pull them out. And um, <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah, he has, like, we get down to the last fish, and I'm about to get it, and he'll take his other hand, that, you know, that, that, the evil hand of envy, and he'll push my fishing rod away, and he'll say, I win! <laughs> and then I say, but you have three fish, I have five. I win! He says. And so I, I flipped the script on him. I didn't, say, I didn't say what you think I'm saying, which is three fish is the winner. I said, okay, the winner gets, gets a kiss. And so if you win, I get to kiss you. And if I win, you get to kiss me. So that's how I, I made it a win-win for everybody. But, um, but envy, anyways, it's this win-lose mentality. Somebody has to win, somebody has to lose. Uh, what's the gospel's answer to envy? The gospel's answer to envy is this. Jesus lost. Jesus lost it all. He was the King of kings, the Lord of lords, in heaven at the right hand of God. He who was clothed in majesty, glory, and splendor, he took it all off. He came to us, got dirty, smelly, stinky, and hungry, and he died for us. But before he did that, he put on the clothes of a servant, literally washing feet. He lost, eventually going to the cross, dying for us. He lost. He had no problem with envy. Then he rose from the dead and vindicated all that he said. Jesus says this, you can gain the whole world. You can win everything. You can win all of it. Have a great business. Be a great name. <clears throat> and get everything that you want in life. And you can lose your soul. Gain the world, lose your soul. You decide. That's the gospel's answer. Let me get to the slander and we're moving on. Slander. Get rid of all slander. These are the gossips. This is the one that... Mm, uh, I have no problem with this, but I really hate it. Okay, Slander is the one uh, just just likes to... Just gossip, gossip, gossip. I'm not going to talk to you, but I'm going to talk about you. That's gossip. Gossip is this. We're having a normal conversation at a normal uh, volume of our voices, and then I have to lower my voice. I have to speak very quietly just because it's just you and me talking. I don't want other people to hear. Slander. Slander. Gossip or slander is this. We're talking, we're having a normal conversation, yeah, <laughs> laughing, laughing, okay, and I have to look over my shoulder just in case so-and-so doesn't hear this. Get rid of slander of all kinds. All kinds. Get rid of it. Just stop it. Just stop it. It's ugly. It's ugly. What's the gospel's answer to this? Have you ever, I want to just ask you, have you ever actually said anything to anybody's face? What you said about him or her to somebody else, have you actually said that thing to him or her? Have you said that? Have you done that? What did Jesus do? You brood of vipers. You whitewashed it. He said it directly to those people. He didn't mince words. He spoke in parables, but he knew. But he said the same. He said what he meant 
to the people he wanted to say it to. He didn't, he didn't try to, you know, back talk. He, he wasn't smiling in their face and then stabbing him in the back. He wasn't doing that. He was telling them straight, you're dying, you're dead, you're, you're, you're going to hell if you don't repent. That's what Jesus did. But here's the thing, though. Okay, because some of us like to do this. We're, we're gonna like, we like to tell people they're wrong, they're, they're, they're mistaken, and I'm right, and you're wrong, and we like to tell them off. But here's what Jesus did. He says, repent. Get it straight. Get it right. You can get right. You can redeem yourself. This is called the redemption. Redemption. If we're going to tell somebody about something they need to change, we've got to help them and tell them how they can change. That's the gospel. Okay, well, we just went through a whole list of uh, bad things to happen, to, to, to do. Uh, Peter says, okay, get rid of all these things. Get rid of all of them, and we're going to move on to uh, new desires. And he says, like newborns, like newborns. He says, don't become babies. He says, look at them. Observe them. And take a look at the newborn. What do they do? They cry every five minutes. Why do they cry every five minutes? Because they're hungry. What are they hungry for? Milk. Milk. And it says, like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk. Just want to make a quick word. If you've been born again, this is a good indication of whether or not you are really a Christian. Do you hunger and thirst for this word? Do you hunger and thirst for a chance to come to church and worship? Do you hunger and thirst to have fellowship with a brother or a sister and pray with them? Is your life somehow empty, incomplete, just not right if you haven't had time with Jesus? If not, you need to consider whether or not you are really born again. Test yourself. Test yourself. And that's, uh, I, we're going to get back to hungering and thirsting. Uh, just uh, want to, just real quick, uh, let, we're gonna, nah, I'm going to move on. Uh, what's the, what's the, the teaching on the pure spiritual milk in verse uh, 2? Okay, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. Now, some of your translations you may have, it says the pure spiritual milk of the Word of God, which is not an incorrect translation. It's, it's more of an explanation. The, the Greek is just pure spiritual milk, and the, the NIV translated it right, and that's more accurate. Uh, and in other translations, uh, Pastor Kevin likes the, the, the message translation. He wrote, it's, uh, it's the kindness, crave the, pray, crave the pure kindness of God. Why? Because in verse 3, what is that spiritual milk that they're talking about? Uh, a lot of Christians think, well, you know, like Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, or the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 5, it's that elementary, simple gospel teaching. Jesus is God. He died and rose. You believe in him, trust in him, you have a new life. It's that simple elementary teaching. That's not what Paul is talking about here. Oh, excuse me. Peter, pure spiritual milk. We get a clue of what it is if you look at verse 3. Verse 3, it says, Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. You've tasted that the Lord is good. The Lord is good also means that the Lord is kind. That's another translation that we find uh, in that, of that Greek. You've tasted God's kindness. You've tasted his goodness. It's a direct quotation from uh, Psalm uh, 38, I believe. I think I missed it. I don't have it in my notes. But basically, in Psalm 38, it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Okay. Um, I need to uh, throw out a few things because we're running out of time. Here's the thing. God says this. Verses 1, 2, and 3. First Peter chapter 2. Get rid of evil. Okay, get rid of it. And there's five things you need to get rid of. Crave, hunger, thirst for good. Not just crave it. You know what? If you don't have that desire, develop it. That's the idea in the Greek tense. Develop a taste. Develop a hunger. Develop your craving for pure spiritual, for good. Now, if I stop there, we end the sermon, we pray and sing a song. 
basically it's a sermon on just do try harder, do better. And it's a moral sermon, and that's not the gospel. Because you're going to think, well, I'm, I, yeah, you're right, Chris. I need to try harder. I need to stop doing this. I need to, to do more. I need to read more. I need to, to wake up earlier. I need to, to have more fellowship. I need to read more blogs. I need to download. I need to try harder. Right? And that would be incomplete. That would be, a, that would be the wrong way to end it. Because we're talking about the gospel. Here's the coolest thing about this, this verse. It says, crave pure spiritual milk. Now, some of you are thinking, I just don't have that hunger. I don't have a desire. It's been a while. I'm at this point in my faith right now, things just seem kind of flat. I don't have it. And some of you are, might be thinking, well, you know, Chris, I just can't change. I've been trying and trying. I, I have tried harder, Chris. I've repented and repented and repented. I just can't change. And then we have this fatalistic, it's a, John Piper calls it spiritual fatalism. I'm just not going to, I'm just, this is the way I am, and God's just going to have to deal with it. My friends, my dear, dear friends, God has dealt with it. And he's given you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you need to believe with the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, that his word is true. And by the power of his word, in Genesis chapter 1, he gave a command. The command was, let there be light. Before that, there was nothing. Before that, it was formless and void. But the power of his word created what his word wanted. In John chapter 11, there was a man named Lazarus. He was dead. There was no life in him. And Jesus said, get up. Jesus gave a command to a dead man to live. And the power of his word created life. Let me take it to your neighborhood. God says to you, who may be just floundering in your faith, who may think, I'm just, I just can't change. God says to you, who have been, been trying so hard and just can't seem to make any progress, God says to you, I commanded you to crave pure spiritual milk. I commanded you to have this longing, and the power of my word creates what it commands. Okay? That's the power of God's word. If God commanded you to have a longing and a desire, don't you think he's going to give you that desire and fulfill that longing? That's how good he is. If he can create the world, raise a dead man from the grave, he can give you the longings that he commanded you to have. That, that quote creates pure spiritual milk. Desire, desire. It comes out of... Uh, Psalm 34, 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The desire. 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 And the, the Japanese has a great way of translating it. Psalm 37, verse 4. Uh, no he will give you all the desires of your heart if you delight in the Lord. Praise God. I don't have a desire. I don't want spiritual milk. I'm just tired of the Bible. I'm tired of church. I'm tired of fellowship. It's okay. If I've commanded it, I'm going to give it to you. You delight yourself in me, I will give you the desires you need. I will give you all the desires of your heart. I'm God. I can do that. He's so good. He's so good. Have you tasted it? If you haven't, oh, talk to me. I'll pray with you. And let me tell you how good he is. He's so good. He's so awesome. And so I want to end with that. Don't just try harder. You don't have to try harder. He's done it all. But trust in him to give you those desires, those longings, to renew the flame, to, to fan it into flame. And he's a good God. He's a good, good God. Amen? Okay, uh, Edmund, why don't you come on up and uh, lead us in this closing song? And guys, would you?
uh, bow your heads, close your eyes, and, and meditate, reflect with me. <clears throat> what are some of those evils that you need to throw off? What are they? Is it malice? Is it deceit? Is it hypocrisy? Is it envy or is it slander? What, what are they? What do you need to deal with? Uh, and what is that longing in your heart? Is it Jesus? Is it his pure milk? Is it his kindness? If not, do you believe that he can give it to you? If so, would you ask for it? Jesus says, ask the Father. He's happy to give you the Holy Spirit when you ask him. Just ask. And so, Lord, we come to you now. We are humbled and we confess the evil that we have harbored in our hearts. Oh God, remove, help us remove the malice, the deceit, the hypocrisy, the envy and the slander, whatever it may be. Lord, that we would crave and desire your pure spiritual milk for your glory, for your kingdom, and for our greater joy. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.